Hello there, and welcome back to the Agostino Zynga Show with I, your host, Agostino Zynga, and this is episode number 601. That is 601 of the Agostino Zynga Show. I hope this finds you well wherever you may be. Hmm. We're back in the hot seat once again. Welcome back, my family and friends. It's been a pretty much um, jam-packed weekend for me. I had many, many different places I had to visit. Number one being a destination wedding with a few friends, which was pretty nice. Um, you know, it's always nice to go and see love, even though, you know, it's not your wedding you're actually taking part in. It's actually nice to see other people making that sacred vow and joining in union, you know, with everybody else around them, family and friends, just giving that pure and utter love. And it's, it's one the, it really is one of the rare occasions, maybe, when maybe someone dies, maybe someone gets married, where legitimately everybody else in that venue is kind of happy to be there. For the most part, other things, you know, like bars and pubs or clubs or parties or football <laughs> events or whatever else if, event that happens where people gather there's going to be a mixture of people in there who don't want to be there or who are there for other reasons apart from wanting to enjoy said event but i think funerals and unfortunately for for us and at funerals and weddings are definitely the rare events where people generally want to be around um the people that they're around or just want to be in that space overall so that was nice having you know immersed myself in that kind of environment um it was also good because this um couple ended up doing a very relaxed kind of wedding something that didn't really require too much um you know from the guest in general right it wasn't something that was too uptight it was very relaxed the whole kind of um, registration thing happened a couple of days beforehand so essentially it was just an opportunity to see loads of family and friends who couldn't attend that and also to go and drink eat and be merry so that was brilliant to see all to all in all but you know those things do take it out of you because they're quite social you're having to kind of reintroduce yourself to a million people you know um you know make connections with people in a very short space of time and get completely blasted so it did take a lot out of me but overall it was a nice kind of mix up and they switch up in terms of tempo of only being around people when i'm listening to flipping hard and fast techno so that was nice that was nice what's happened over the weekend um united didn't play because the flipping match was postponed because aunt lizzie or queen lizzie decided to pass away and disturb you know the rest of our lives it's been a really opposite of rest in peace hasn't it it's not been rest in peace it's been she's rested but then she's also kind of brought our lives into disrepute so you know from flights getting cancelled to premier league games getting postponed it's been a bit of a horror show so there was no football to watch that was a bit annoying but there was series to catch up on and one series i ended up watching on the monday was of course House of Dragon and I know I've speak, spoken about this a million times I get it I get it I get it but House of Dragon is com it's so good it's you know what you know what you know the thing about House of Dragon actually I've just realized it's not the fact that it's really good it's the fact that it's really good in comparison to Rings of Power which is obviously on Amazon Prime right and Rings of Power is so terrible <laughs> when you watch, especially if you watch House of Dragon first and then you watch, or House of the Dragon, sorry, first, then you watch Rings of Power, you definitely see the difference in quality. And I mentioned it previously. Rings of Power has everything. It has all the visual effects. It has a pretty decent cast of characters. Um, actors probably not that great, but overall it's a pretty stellar group of people kind of, you know, in reprising those roles. But the writing and the overall pacing of the show is just all over the place. It'll be an hour and 10 minutes of an episode and you feel like nothing has actually happened. Nothing substantial. And even though we're four or five episodes in, I think you don't really feel invested in any of the characters at all. You're not really rooting for anybody. You're just kind of watching it to see what transpires but there is no kind of hook but house of dragon i think has already hooked the majority of people especially if you're already a fan of game of thrones from episode one and for sure after episode five which has happened and again if you're listening to this and you haven't watched episode five yet there are going to be spoilers ahead so please make sure you skip ahead for episode five specifically if you're a fan of house of dragon or house of the dragon i keep saying house of dragon house of the dragon you're definitely going to be a fan of episode five and episode five was absolutely banging my favorite scene has to be when Rhaenyra's um tied the knot with um what's his name leonor um from what she was house valerian right and they're in the wedding ceremony which is epically put together right i feel like even though they didn't spend as much money as they did in rings of power i feel like the house of the dragon crew um did a really good job in terms of using what they had and i feel like a lot of it is done with real kind of panache it's not over the top even the color gradings were done really well it just looks amazing right it kind of really transports you into the world of flipping um 
George R. R. Barton. And it also longs and makes you wish that that guy would finish those books. Please, for the love of God, because I'd love to see a reboot of Game of the Thrones done in HBO style. But in general, it's an incredible scene that when they tied the not at the wedding, because essentially, um, Damon comes through. You know, he's got the Damon thing is always really cool too, because I guess by now, maybe the showrunners had an idea or kind of had an inkling watching back the series. But essentially, his his walk has become a little bit of a meme. If you go on the House of the Dragon subreddit, people kind of praise how badass of a walk he's got. And somehow, I guess the showrunners realized that that would be a thing. In episode five, he struts in with his hood up, but the camera just pans to his feet. So you don't actually see who it is, but you know straight away it's Damon by his sort of gate as he's walking in. And it's an ep epic, epic, epic introduction because it's good. there's a couple of them. I think there's Alison comes in in the middle of Osiris' um, uh, speech and obviously Damon also comes in kind of last minute and sits down at one of the ends of the table. It's a really, really good episode. And then once it gets to the point of them kind of doing the mating ritual wedding dance thing in the middle, which is oddly, oddly... I don't know it's just oddly tribe it's not oddly, it's tribal um it's it's just it's really emotive even though it's really kind of corny the clapping and stuff but it kind of gets you in a way right it's sort of like they're kind of bonding and a weird sort of spiritual level and then Damon sort of like swags in there he's, he's seen enough because he's obviously getting turned on or he's wanting to make sure that she knows that you know you're mine you're not his he then gets into the middle of the dance floor and then he starts to talk to her and then you know uh, Rhaenerys basically says if you want me you should take me right now like you know basically puts you know puts it on him for less of a better term and it's such an intense scene because it keeps panning to other people who are obviously involved or are invested in the marriage such as um Vin, um, what you call it, the Leonor's dad, Leon, however you pronounce his name, uh, it pans over to, I think, uh, Sir Kristen, it pans over to Viserys, it pans over to a lot of people who invested somehow in a wedding. And then what transpires is a massive fight that happens there. Um, you know, Sir Kristen Cole ends up essentially killing, um, you know, Venerys's husband to be's uh, boy toy ends up kind of crushing his face which is flipping crazy to see because again there's a lot of scenes on there um there's a scene early on in the episode where daemon essentially kills his actual wife i guess in preparation for leaving himself open to marry um his flipping cousin and that scene you don't actually see the final death blow it's already painful enough seeing her kind of fall and bust her head back on the back of a horse and essentially you kind of hear a skull crack or a spine crack or something that she can't move basically so it gives a feeling that she may be paraplegic from that one fall and then she shouts oh you can never finish right which is a really great insult when you're about just about to die and he picks up a rock as he's walking away and just goes to basically smash her and cave her head in and you know it's then reported later on that she was found with her head caved in um and it's incredible. So you don't actually see that scene. Same way you don't actually see um, Sir Kristen basically, you know, cave this guy's head in. But you could you could basically see him punching and blood kind of squirting and kind of hitting his face and stuff. It's flipping an incredible scene. And also goes to show you where the turn happens. Because throughout this episode, it's quite hard to understand where the turn happens. Where, where Sir Kristen basically goes bad on um, the Targaryens in general. And then kind of, you know, lines up with Alison in that kind of side of things you know against the greens and the blacks but we get it from this episode although the only thing that's a bit concerning is that we didn't actually see um Rhaenerys in the black uniform that would have been quite nice to see her in the black dress to kind of you know go back to the books and whatnot but that kind of Sir Kristen thing was awesome to see we definitely saw where he definitely kind of switches over and decides to kind of um align his loyalties to Alicent the queen um, but yeah, incredible scene overall. Just an incredible TV series to watch. It's really starting to ramp up. Episode 5 was definitely um, up there. One of my favourites. I think the writer for this is also meant to be doing episode 9. A lot of people on the subreddit have to say a lot of good things about her and how she's basically paced the show, the writing, everything about the character development. I'm invested in everybody. It's just really great to see. The only thing I was really concerned about actually that I didn't actually clock on was I'm not really too sure what happened with the, um, with the boy toy and Sir Kristen. When he was obviously you know telling him hey i know your secret i know you've obviously been with uh Rhaenerys. was it was it the fact that he was telling him that that annoyed him the fact that he's being put in a position to get um essentially blackmailed or whatever it may be or was it the fact that when he walked past him i thought this guy maybe kind of rubbed or kind of you know brushed his hand against sir christian's genitals or something 
maybe that was like the thing and he kind of felt emasculated he kind of felt like you know he's being taken advantage of um and he just didn't like it and kind of flipped the switch i'm not really sure what happened but either way um that was a great scene because it started off pretty innocent and tame and then by the time they finished the conversation you knew that they were gonna not be on good terms at all but you didn't ever think that it would result in you didn't think that conversation would result into a christian caving the guy's head in but it did go that way so that's been quite crazy to see and also the really bittersweet moment of it was at the end where they do tie the knot officially you then see because obviously it was a big fight and obviously the other you know this guy who's meant to be marrying Rhaenerys was obviously injured to him you know I think he got a bloody nose or a broken nose they got to tie the knot amongst all the debris of the fight that happened prior um, and he's all bloodied and you know Rhaenerys looks dishevelled and she's crying and she's basically upset like you know I didn't mean for this to happen she's obviously because you know they had like a connection before and they and and in that moment you see them both sort of like come into the understanding that they don't really have a say in anything in their life they, they this is their duty so in regards of what happens they have to always sort of honor their duty and that's the kind of real sad thing when you see in it um it's that sad realization that you know everything that kind of happens around them happens and they have to kind of react to it but they don't really have a say in it really at this moment anyway in their kind of lives which is really bittersweet but whoa, what a good series man and again like i said like it's so much better than Rings of Power. It just makes Rings of Power watching really pointless. But, you know, I've started Rings of Power, so I'll probably have to end it. But I'm not invested in it in the slightest. And it goes to show that, you know, it's not what you have, it's how you use it. A lot of people, especially people on YouTube, I know I've kind of stumbled across people like that. And I've also had my moments of weakness where I thought, oh, I need this equipment. I need this thing to kind of create good work and to be considered um, a proper content creator, or whatever it may be. And it's not the case. If you can't make it work with the little that you have available, doesn't matter what kind of SLR you get, what kind of editing suite you have, it's never going to work out. And I think we've seen that with House of the Dragon compared to Amazon. Amazon had a massive flipping budget compared to what they were doing at HBO with House of the Dragon, especially off the back of game of thrones i'd assume hbo would have, weren't willing to really back up the brinks truck because you never know it couldn't have worked out it, it maybe wouldn't have worked out and it might not have been great so they probably were quite timid in terms of their approach in terms of budgeting and everything else because i'm sure next season and season after that will be far better in terms of visually you'll definitely see an up an upgrade because of the response they're getting from the fans but amazon went out full pelt on this whole you know rings of power a lot of the rings rings of power thing um they did a lot bang, a load of promo many of it was cringy but they did put a lot of money behind it and clearly they were kind of trying to position it as some sort of um, woke version of lord of the rings something that was more inclusive and all the sort of buzzwords that you'd think people on the internet would like but in general people who actually watch tv series who aren't on the internet commenting on social justice issues they just want to watch good tv they don't care what the message is really if the if the if the if the kind of plot line is good the writing is good the character development's good they'll watch just about anything and um I think we've seen that proof, you know, from some of the popular TV series over the last few years. But the fact that they kind of centered it, I think, all on workness, maybe killed it on Dead and Arrival. The fact that a lot of the people involved in the show were essentially blaming and pointing the finger at fans if they did get a poor reception and labeling them racist and all this sort of stuff was not really the right way to go about things especially something as niche as lord of the rings if if game of thrones and all that stuff is very geeky and very niche and, and, all, and only applies to a certain group of people i can only imagine who really paid attention to lord of the rings and tolkien's work it's not really the it's not all the over it's not the general public i mean it's not star wars so you definitely do need those diehard fans to watch it and for some reason whoever's involved in the show didn't want to do that they disparage the fans and essentially killed the show before it even arrived so it was dead on arrival and now after a few weeks of comparing both shows there's no denying that house of dragon is far far better than rings of power and it's not even fair to even compare them to be completely honest but hey what can you do what can you do um over the weekend what else happened that i wanted to talk about? oh yeah this topic so i'm sure most of you aren't aware because this is something that occurred in my little um you know uh, orbit of dj stuff and nightlife things whatever it may be but gordo formerly known as carnage has been a bit of hot water on social media these days um because he refused to end his set at london nightclub uh what was it at was it uh ministry of sound that's it ministry of sound so the dj who was meant to play the end set or the set after him i'm not sure it's the end one um basically couldn't play because gordo refused to come off the decks which is an interesting story because i think i covered something similar um that occurred with the blessed madonna at a fred again event and um, this dj called bambi who i'm not really too familiar with a lot of people um you know have known her who kind of commented on my video that i put out before about it uh, basically she was booked to play the 
closing set of a kind of headline Bless Madonna set and Fred again. Um, she arrived at the venue on time for a set was meant to be at 3 a.m. I think to 4 or something like that. Um, she gets to the booth and essentially, you know, Bless Madonna basically ignores her and doesn't let her get on. She then talks to the manager. The manager says, wait. Then she confirms with the club, it's meant to be 3 a.m. And essentially there's loads of back and forth, but essentially she gets, you know, told to chill. And then she ends up only playing for 45 minutes just towards the end and not a full hour, which obviously is disappointing when you've traveled an hour there, when you've had your friends or maybe fans come out to come and see you. And then you get to play a 45 minute set. It can kind of, you know, it can kind of be a bit of a bummer, especially off the back of that lady too, being a black woman, being a young black woman too in the industry. You can only imagine the stuff that she's had to put up with on a kind of daily or monthly, weekly basis whenever she's out on the road. Now she attributed it straight away to racism, which I didn't agree with at the time, and I got a lot of stick from it. I remember when I did mention it, um, because you know, d these days the easiest thing to do when there are kind of um, occurrences of inequality or occurrences of you know unfairness is to point the finger at racism because it kind of just encapsulates and explains everything. But I think, especially when it comes to stuff concerning the entertainment industry, especially when it comes to stuff concerning nightlife and club culture and DJs and all that sort of stuff, I think for the most place, for the most part, um, you shouldn't attribute racism to it. You should just attribute cuntiness. Because I think I've been around long enough, and I'm sure some of you guys have been around long enough too, to know that there's a lot of cunts in this scene, a lot of them, whether they're male, whether they're female, whether they're men, whether they're women, whether they're trans, whether they're gay, whether they're whatever, whether they're black, white, Asian, there's a lot of cunts. They exist on every um, sort of level of the scene, unfortunately. And for me, I've always been a weird idealist when it comes to this sort of stuff. I've kind of always thought to myself, like, why don't we try to create our own version of a utopia in this little nightlife, little bubble that we have, right? And um, why don't we try to kind of create what we'd love to see in the wider world? But obviously it doesn't happen because mainly my kind of thing is why it doesn't happen is because it's nightlife stuff. And nightlife generally tends to attract the more um, deplorable people um, out there, right? Um, a lot of kind of freak shit happens at night. So it's kind of hard to create a utopia amongst all this sort of like devilish sort of energy so that might explain it but it is a bit of a shame it doesn't happen and I think this is a good example of it being more so an issue of cunts let's just do racism because Gordo from what I can see as a black man maybe he's you know maybe he's flipping um, what do you call it maybe he's of um, South American Central American descent or something but he clearly looks like he would be someone you would describe as black and he obviously was big timing two prominent quote-unquote um white djs so this is a clear difference in this sort of paradigm but also shows you that clearly this is a more of an issue of cunts and less of an issue of racism and um when it comes to this sort of issue first off my initial reaction would be hey why not, right? Why not have a black guy, a DJ, big time a couple of white dudes at a flipping party? Because essentially we are the creators of this industry. Well, we are the creators of this music, right? Um, maybe not the scene. Um, we birthed it, but essentially we're not really proportionally represented when it comes to DJs on lineups and whatnot. Um, I know for myself how difficult it's been to kind of, you know, get put on certain lineups or play at certain places, mainly because I'm not really that well known and also because, you know, maybe I just don't look the part, whoever it may be. But it is kind of startling to see the disparity, especially when you consider the people that go to these events and also the where the music actually come from. So a part of me is like, yeah, go on, Gordo, stick it to these two white devils, isn't it? And let them kind of sit out and not play their set and just kind of big time them and over overplay until the very end, until those guys leave, isn't it? Fuck it, why not? But then the other side of me also thinks what how, how I would feel if I was going to play at venue. I was all excited. I got myself prepped. I spent a week or the month before prepping my USBs, putting my playlist together, tagging everything correctly, um, you know, bringing, packing my stuff, traveling to the venue, whether it's in my car or driving or flying there, really amped and excited to go, doing all the promo bits and the lame social media stuff on social media and get myself amped. And then I get there and the DJ of me just doesn't want to come off the decks not for any other reasons though because they're just loving the attention and they don't want to share the limelight with anybody else that just goes against everything kind of club culture sort of stands for and what kind of dj culture stands for so that's the part of me that kind of thinks you know what that was a real cunty move regardless right so let's kind of um you know go ahead and sort of like roughly put or get together the timeline so this is courtesy of business techno of course who covered this story pretty well and this is a dj called ways who posted the following thing on instagram has or well, posted the following thing on twitter but obviously um business techno posted on instagram it says as follows 
Has anyone ever turned up for a gig where the headline act has decided they're going to stay on the decks and not allow any of the other acts booked to play? I say, yes, that's happened to me a couple of times. Um, usually it's, it's usually like somebody who I would say, uh, it usually happens at, I wouldn't say even big artists. I've, I've, I've played in flipping crappy sort of like, you know, friends recommendation warehouse parties and had somebody do the same thing just just didn't want to come off the decks was feeling it too much um and just basically aired everybody until the point where someone had to essentially like pull out a cord then he sort of like kind of paid attention and we kind of finally got on with the decks um but it's happened across the board it happens with big time djs you want to big time you and sun you and it also happens with people in warehouse parties who just are feeling the vibe feeling the love haven't played out forever and just want to keep going and going and going Another one it says headline DJ refused to come after last last night. I I love that even in this world, similar to how there is you know in other industries, people are afraid to put a name on it. I don't really know why because it's not as if DJ Carnage's people are going to prevent this Wade guy from getting any gigs. You assume so, right? I don't even think they even operate in the same sort of stratosphere because it sounds like a weird booking to have them alongside each other. Maybe I'm not getting it. Maybe they are all kind of business techno tech house type of people. But it's strange that he would even be that you know, scared not to kind of put a name on it because why not? Because we all find out anyway. But anyway, it doesn't matter. Headline DJ refused to come off last night and the two acts after him, me and another DJ, lost our sets. <laughs> I'm over a decade play. It must it's probably hard to take on my level, right? But it must be even difficult to take on somebody at this is level, right? Where you've been nominated for stuff, you tour the world, you go to festivals, you get interviewed by radio and you're on magazines and shit. And then some other guy basically just says, nah, you're not coming on. It must be a real humbling experience. Like, you know, no matter how big you get, there's always somebody bigger than you that can put you in your place. <laughs> it's absolutely brutal, this industry, honestly. It continues. I'm over a decade of playing. I've honestly never seen this level of entitlement or arrogance. And I've DJed with way bigger and better artists. Oh, little diss there at the end. Cheeky. He still didn't put a name on it. So, you know, it's still a bit pussy to me. But anyway, it continues. I've, um, I felt for the artist li liaison and no blame their way. But what a bizarre situation to be placed in. Said artist didn't even acknowledge me. Just told the artist liaison, I'm not fucking coming off. <laughs> Proper evil BDE energy, in it? Evil DJ BDE energy. It continues. Um, at the start of this, I just wanted to really explain someone had texted me why I wasn't playing when I was meant to be. And the fact that it wasn't me playing tape, the top 40 tech house, 4 to 5 a.m. It's hard. You know what? To be honest, like it's hard to throw an insult at somebody who's playing ahead of you, who's playing shitty music when you're also on the same lineup as them. Because usually you would imagine if you're on the same lineup with a terrible DJ, it probably means that you're probably part of the terrible music that they're putting out. You're in that same sort of scene, right? I'd imagine. It's very rare, I'd assume, where you'd see fucking Ricardo Villalobos playing alongside, I don't know, Michael Bibby or something, right? I don't think so. Those, those things happen. Um, usually if you're on those lineups, you're there because you are adjacent to that scene you're part of it too um so yeah it's funny that he kind of throw that little insult in there regardless but um obviously the reaction from the people on techno tour has been vicious everyone's kind of been going for him annabella ross posted this pretty funny oh someone like under annabella ross posted this pretty funny clip of um gordo playing at this place called cub space and i guess feeling himself with gum fingers or whatever and i don't know what what he's doing here why this makes any sense why he decided to do it who knows <laughs> Okay, cool. And then, of course, underneath that, they're just absolutely ripping into him. So it's been pretty funny to see that kind of um, transpire overall. Proper amateur, don't he know that the mixer knobs are hot like lava while you're holding onto Twitter for too long? Taking a piss of the people at back, clearly having fun and not having fun. And just a lot of kind of, you know, comments that you would think would be attributed to this sort of stuff, right? And like I said prior, I think this is a clear demonstration of what I said beforehand regarding the Blessed Madonna situation and uh, the, that lady called Bambi, who unfortunately was, you know, made to wait for ages before she was able to play, wasn't really a case of racism and more so a case of a DJ just being a pure and utter cunt because for the most part, all of us had to start from the same place unless you were somebody that got grandfathered in, your, your, you know, whatever it may be, or you got brought in, I don't know, spent by your dad or something. For the most part, every DJ under the sun has had to play horrible hotel lounge bar gigs horrible pub gigs horrible club gigs where no one turns up like just terrible shit right and you kind of slowly but surely you know keep, keep 
you know you, you remain persistent you remain consistent and you just keep building and then hopefully you get to the point where you can actually play the place that you do enjoy to play at but you always remember where you came from so sometimes when you do go to a hotel lobby and you see some guy in the corner playing disco at flipping 4 p.m in the afternoon you know exactly how he he or she feels and you can kind of emote to it and you kind of be a bit more um forgiving to them if they you know if they look bored or whatever it may be or you might even have a chat with them because you know how they feel and what that situation is like but when people like this act like where they are it kind of just puts a bit of a sour taste in your mouth i mean there are djs out there who are that kind of up their own ass they kind of makes you feel a bit worried about it but it's just funny to see all these clips and obviously the, the the flipping jesus christ fucking post hands out wide bow in front of me i am the dj god me playing other people's music really loudly in the club means that you have to kiss my feet and honor me like i'm a fucking deity or something right so obviously uh people are absolutely going for him but something you know a little bit of a bad taste in my mouth is the fact that i don't feel like the blessed madonna got the same level of attention and i think some people have mentioned it so it's a bit you know harsh to see that maybe it's because in general female djs aren't really as popular as male djs so the profile isn't as big so maybe the issue isn't you know if someone if a male dj does something like that maybe people won't really mind but i think back to what happened with peggy Goo and daniel wang and everyone was talking about that um but for the for some reason the annabella ross sorry the, the sorry annabella ross the flipping blessed madonna situation in bambi kind of went under the radar i think i might have been the only person that kind of covered it really in any detail on youtube at least and it kind of just kind of died and kind of went away um, but for the most part, everybody's kind of obviously going at this, right? You've got an outlet like um, your EDM obviously covering it. And then of course, I've got this place called The Song Kick. If I go backwards um, and go a list of other news outlets, I'm sure I could see other people too that covered it. Let me see if I can get it up on here. Maybe it's on here. There we go. If you do a Google search, you can see many, many places that also covered the same sort of thing, right? Um, let's see if I can get on a new source. Yeah, see? You got a place called Weave Ray View. Um, you got yeah many other places have kind of covered it, right? And Ministry of Sound have covered it, and other places too. So it's clearly kind of caught wind uh, for some reason, you know, vis-a-vis -vis what happened with um, what you call it, Bambi Plus Madonna, and um, yeah, so people are out there going angry about it. And I guess God has finally replied. I think it looks like um, to kind of clear the act, the issue up a little bit, right? Um, so. He said the following. Let me see if yeah, his actual Instagram account because he said he did the Instagram live, right? Let's see what he did there. But it's just interesting to see this stuff in it because it's like Gordo by name, Gordo by fucking nature. Greedy, 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 greedy guy. Um, let's see. So Gordo DJ um, Instagram. Let's see if he's posted anything because he said he was on a live. So I'm doing this live actually and to see what this guy said before we actually read his statement on Twitter. Let's quickly go. He said, what really happened in London on Sunday morning? Ministry of Sound. Hilarious, dude. Let's see if we can see this. There's no post on here from the video we don't see. <laughs> uh, no wonder they hate him on Techno Twitter, man. He's everything they hate. Just looking at those pictures. What they? He said he's going. Okay, he didn't go live. Okay, he didn't go live. Okay. So he didn't go live at all. So I don't see the live post on there. Um, if anybody else has got it, then please pass it along. But just scanning his Instagram, I could definitely see why Techno Twitter will not be a fan of him, innit? He's got loads of dudes up on the stage behind him. He's standing on top of the decks. He's got his sunglasses on, Cuban links. He's got T-shirts with his own name on it. Um, loads of loads of uh, white ladies and bare buttocks are out as well. You know, designer sunglasses, pictures with him and Drake back in the day. Um, you know, just stuff that people wouldn't like. Shopping, I think there's a shopping picture I saw here. Yeah. Selfridges with a bag crossing the street. Loads of funny shit on there. So clear why techno, techno Twitter for the most part wouldn't be a fan of the good dude. So let's see what he said anyway. His explanation is as follows. Godo versus v, via Twitter. He said, I've been ex I've been doing extended Godo sets ranging from three hours to ten hours to give my fans... <laughs> Yeah, but he started off with some fucking arrogance. Look at this guy, man. I am the Don. I play for more than two hours. If you, you know I mean, if you're playing after me, just be aware I am going to big time you. <laughs> anyway, um, I've been 
doing sets for three hours or 10 hours to give my fans the best experience possible. And I was incredibly excited about my headlining Ministry of Sound UK debut. Okay, but it's a headlining set. It doesn't mean you, it, it's not, you're not playing all night, mate. So you still have to give other people a sh chance to play. If you want to play all night, promote an all night set. Don't promote a headlining set. Because if he was that big of a deal, he would just play it by himself and be prepared to sell as many tickets as possible. But clearly, you know, Minstrel Sound's a fucking big venue. You know, it's, it's unlikely, you know, somebody like Gordo will be able to sell it out. Not, not like, it's not, you know, it, it can happen, but it's unlikely. So that's why you fill it out with other people. So him saying that is fucking wild. Anyway, it continues. We've been working on this show for months. My agent that flew in from Germany, ooh, big agent from Germany, um, who was there, one of my main promoters and management prior and during the show told me that my time slot was flexible. <laughs> this guy's a cunt. This guy's a proper cunt. See what I mean? It doesn't, it, it, do not attribute to racism what can be attributed to cuntinism. Honestly, this is pure cuntinism. What an absolute piece of shit. <laughs> this is just a situation where you can just say hey i fucked up sorry i was feeling a vibe i extend my apologies to ways and easel um i've extended an invite for them to come and see me play or to come out and play with not come and see play to come out and play with me at my next festival at this i've you know covered the flights and accommodation as a you know as an apology for the last event hopefully we can make up and you know it's all one love or whatever you know what i mean that's what you should do extend an olive branch this guy's just explaining why he was a cunt and explaining why he wasn't wrong <laughs> <laughs> okay continue let's just continue because i keep stuff in here he says yeah um let's continue again my management that flew in from germany ooh, who was there one of the main promoters and the management prior and during the show told me that my time slot was flexible seeing the seeing as the club stayed open until 6 a.m and that there would be a closer on standby if i wanted to end early <laughs> what a prick i was not informed that this meant ways or easel wouldn't be able to get a proper opportunity but if you saw them in the booth why wouldn't you just assume that they were the other djs that wanted to play and why wouldn't you just say you know what i've had my fun you guys jump on do a little back to back or you can play whatever like why would you just like <laughs> this guy anyway continues i've been djing for see they've both did that though innit? it um you know easel did the same thing right away is the same thing i've been playing for more than 10 years this is unacceptable him as well i've been playing for many years i can be a prick anyway, continues um i have never had this issue ever with another act <laughs> because they're too scared mate you're fucking massive you just done a fucking collab album with drake you know what i mean you're probably signed to wme or something or caa or something you've probably got great representation you know what i mean it's clear why they don't say your name come on or they don't even mention it because they don't want to be blackboard that's pretty obvious um or maybe your security guys probably don't even let them get next to the booth <laughs> imagine that you go to play a closing set and you're finishing a night where gordo played that and you can't even get into the booth and you're playing the, the, the security guards will leave. <laughs> it's kind of comforting this sort of stuff because it's good to know that shitty situations happen to every DJ regardless of where along the journey you are. Because I know I've had situations where I felt like complete shit and questioned why I'm doing it, you know, where you've kind of gone to play somewhere and the promoter runs away, you can't find him the whole night and you basically leave and he doesn't ever pay you. Those kind of things <laughs> happen, right? Or you, you get booked for a gig, it confirms and then they don't conf they don't really confirm anything and it doesn't happen. Like, loads of shitty things happen and you feel like, oh, it's just because you're at like a lowly level, but it seems like different sort of like county situations or hurdles kind of come your way along the way, regardless of how big you are. And you just have to kind of figure out how to sort of manage them. But anyway, continue. So let's continue. Let's continue. <laughs> I've never had this issue with, ever with another act. It was obvious miscommunication. No, it wasn't. And I'm so sorry that it happened to them. Okay, he finally said sorry after all those lines of text. Good to see. I've been ways and ease of shoes before though and understand. <laughs> so he's basically saying, I've been there, bruv. Just suck it up. It is what it is. I'm the bigger guy. You know what I mean? Like I've got the bigger profile. You're playing at my show. That's what basically he's saying. Um, just grin and bear it and you can maybe you know what happens with this sort of stuff actually this is what breeds a bad environment and culture overall what happens is that you get treated like shit by somebody and more often than not because everybody around them is a piece of shit and the industry overall is just not giving you good vibes you end up then reciprocating that shitty stuff to other people coming up too instead of correcting that kind of attitude that's the issue at hand i think for the most part um 
and that's where kind of it kind of breathes for a minute. It continues. Um, I've been ways, I've been in ways and easels um, shoes before though, and understand what shitty spot they were put in. So let me make it up to you both. Let's get you added to some of my future shows as a make good. Oh, okay, did do that. Okay, let's make just make it to my future shows as a make good. That's nice. So he did actually make it good by offering them an opportunity to play at one of his <laughs> next shows. <laughs> Hopefully they're not opening like from like, I don't know, 6 p.m. till 9 <laughs> you know I mean? or something. But that's quite nice that he did that at the end. But still, the the, the ego and the kind of uh, hubris from this guy is out of, off the chain, isn't it? He spent so much time justifying his cuntiness only to apologise and, and offer a solution. But still, a lot of text there basically illustrating why people had a kind of bad vibe from the whole situation and kind of were really, really pissed off in general. Um, let me actually see. I think the easel guy made a post too. What did he say about the whole thing? Did he speak about it too? I think he did, if I'm not mistaken. Let me go. I think it might be a business test note thing. I think he spoke about it too. Was he on there? I can't see him on there. Maybe it's on this one. Uh, look at this troll. He, he announced he was quitting music and then I think he changed his name to fucking whatever he changed it to, right? But this is Ezel. Ezel said the same. Let's see what Ezel said. Ezel at the time said, um, first of all, I'd like to apologize to people that came all the way to Ministry of Sound to support me last night. <laughs> yes, I did. I drove 10 hours. <laughs> Honestly, it's fucking brutal, this industry. Honestly, it's DJing is one of the most thankless tasks ever, mate. Like, I've played in fucking pub breweries before, DJing in a little laptop with a MIDI controller. I've played at weddings that no one turned up to. <laughs> I played at flipping student lobbies, right? <laughs> where where I was told, hey, we want house music. I got there and brought all my house music, like Omar S and that type of stuff. And those guys wanted, like, I don't know, um, what's his name? They wanted disclosure type house and I had none of it. I had like proper house music and they wanted like top 50 house music. So I, I had to play four hours of stuff that they didn't like and they, and they, they um, vociferously let me know that they didn't like what I played. <laughs> And the promoter was so angry to have me the money at the end of the night. I felt like it was daylight robbery. I've done all that stuff. I've played out outdoors in gardens, like horrible things, right? With one speaker, like terrible, terrible parties. So it's just honestly weirdly comforting to know that a verified blue tick artist and DJ from Instagram is having the same sort of you know, obviously on a different scale, but also having fucking excruciatingly painful and hurtful sort of experiences, just trying to pursue their dreams, put some food on the table, you know, provide a good time for the pun. It's quite comforting. I'm not going to lie. It, it, maybe there's something comforting in, you know, shared misery and pain, but I'm not laughing at the guy's situation in general. It's just absolutely horrible, man. <laughs> yes, I drove 10 hours in my first set at the main room, Ministry Sound. I spent six hours curating playlists. It was massive deal for me my set time was between 5 6 5 a.m to 6 a.m in the box and i had friends there and people who would come down just to support i got to come at 4 a.m which is well before his time this means this guy's prompt and professional about what he does got one hour ahead of time i usually arrive at 30 minutes sometimes 10 minutes before my set so this guy came an hour before and he's a fucking legit artist there's a lot about him um so props I got to the club at 4 a.m. and was told that Gordo slash Carnage <laughs> slash Prick <laughs> had refused to come up to set, um, leaving the artist before me waiting around. As time passed on, it was clear Gordo wasn't coming off the stage <laughs> for the rest of the artist. So um, not only for this, but then he refused to come off of my slot playing a total of three and a half hours. You imagine telling somebody with autism that the plan had changed. In that moment, I was so overwhelmed. <laughs> really, Easel? All right, anyway, I was over on the artist that was in the same position was so chill with me that I ended up feeling chill after talking to him. I'm extremely disappointed that I did not get the opportunity to play in the box room at Ministry of Sound and hope that one day I'll get the opportunity to do so again. Hopefully Ministry of Sound put them on again and just let them play back to back the whole night. That'll be nice. Thank you, Ministry of Sound, for staying professional and thankful for ways for being so lovely. You made my night worth it. <laughs> it's also funny as well like in this scene of tech house stuff like three and a half hours is deemed to be a long set that's to be to be like whoa this guy played forever man he was on for ages 
when really like in techno scene or house scene especially outside of this sort of commercial bubble four hours is like the minimum to kind of really get your feet under the table to really provide a vibe do you know what I mean that's the, that's the minimum um, but so to people to get really irate that you're playing for three hours says a lot it basically says that all the top guys and gals are being flown around the world private jets and stuff buying Balenciaga to play one and a half hours and getting paid bucket loads of cash so maybe that's why the venues don't really bother because if you're gonna pay this dude let's say 20 grand to play somewhere and he wants to go over time and he still is happy with the 20 grand you're gonna be happy with it you're like, Fuck, whatever in it because the more people that are around in the club they're gonna be like oh wow he's going over the time they're gonna keep buying drinks they're gonna keep doing their drugs and dancing and shit so it works out pretty well for the venue this is probably why they don't get involved so you're as a dj you're literally on your own you have to kind of scrap you have to kind of get in there and you know i start throwing some blows you know what i mean elbows and whatnot and so hey come here come here get off the stage get off the stage but clearly that didn't work clearly that didn't happen god a one in the end but he still offered them a little you know a little olive a little olive branch by saying hey come and play at my next show <laughs> play the opening set and i'll play the rest of, i'll play the good hours you play the shit hours no i don't think you said that but let's see how that transpires in general but again that kind of proves my point that in general you know don't attribute to racism what can attribute to cuntism because in general in this scene especially there are a lot of cunts at every level you just have to kind of find out a way to navigate around them but you're going to come across them one way or the other sooner or later Next, I want to quickly touch upon this news, which I thought was hilarious over the weekend, right? There was this post I went viral, no pun intended, of Post Malone performing at his show, and it looked like he tripped over or he kind of, you know, um, didn't remember that there was a sort of lower bit on the stage that I guess he's meant to be coming up in, I think, or something. I don't know what it is, but he basically didn't see the hole in the stage and he tripped and fell um, face first into the gap and basically hit his ribs on the kind of edge. And the immediate responses from people online or stuff or stuff like this, courtesy of No Jumper, that says, Post Malone took a fall on stage and cracked three ribs. Medics took him away, but he still managed to return to the stage and finish the show. So it was kind of like a hero kind of thing, right? Oh my God, he's so strong. Oh my God, he's so lovely to the fans. Look at him persevering. And I remember seeing it thinking, how can you crack three ribs legitimately and still perform? Especially the reason why I was so skeptical about it in the first place is because my, um, you know, my recent loving with flipping the UFC, I've started to watch UFC pretty regularly the last few years or so. And I know from watching the UFC that when it pertains to cracked ribs, um, you know, even sprained, you know, cracked ribs for the most part, not broken fully, but just, you know, fractures or whatever it may be. It's, it's one of the most painful injuries that you can get as a fighter because you don't realize how often you use your ribs, right? With just kind of moving and twisting around and stuff and just generally breathing. It's very, very painful. For. so the fact that you know fighters can't fight after they crack their ribs it's very unlikely that a rapper singer guy who's moving around and dancing on a stage can also get up and perform so i immediately was like oh this is cap but for whatever reason like i said when this video went viral everyone just assumed he did break his ribs and i'm gonna play the video for you now as you can see he's falling bang he falls on the stage and let's see hear the crowd make the noise as he falls down actually <laughs> it's funny with the music playing in the background and him withering in pain on the floor. But I always honestly knew it was capped straight away because, you know, you can't fall like that, crack your ribs and keep performing. And then, of course, news came out and transpired that he didn't crack his, crack his ribs, sorry. He bruised them slightly, which obviously makes sense because he did fall from a pretty decent height and he did fall kind of face first. Clearly, as well, it's, it's opportunity to kind of state that it's pretty obvious as well. This guy doesn't play sports or hasn't really played sports because one thing I know from watching a lot of sort of um, public freak out videos and compilations of people falling over, which I love to watch, don't ask me why, is that usually a kind of prerequisite of somebody who played sports or skateboarded or whatever it's usually their ability to brace when they fall down so when you're falling face first you usually kind of put your hands in in front of you you maybe twist a little bit so you can maybe roll to your side or roll to your back but if it involves you having to fall fall kind of flat on your face you do whatever necessary not to do that or just to avoid any kind of serious injury but people who don't who aren't kind of used to the rough and tumble of playing or 
you know, whatever, or just fucking around, not even playing sports. They don't do that. They just kind of they let the gravity take them where they want to take them. Arms out wide and just, you know, bang, go straight to the floor, which obviously leads to the, you know, broken jaws, teeth missing, nose cracks, sockets flipping, um, fractured, all that sort of stuff. Um, but people that have played sports usually avoid those kind of things. So when I saw him falling, I knew immediately, okay, this man just drinks beer, smokes cigarettes, and doesn't play any sports in the slightest. And you can see it from that. But him moving on the, on the floor like he's a football player, it's fucking hilarious and them saying that he fucking cracked his ribs is ridiculous but i think this is all part of the mystification of artists in general yeah it's probably this is a genuine this genuine event but whoever's working in the background for him was smart enough to immediately put out a story that he's cracked his ribs and he but he came back on stage and still performed for his fans because posty loves his fans that's what immediately did and i think that is essentially what you know, artistry and entertainment is about nowadays is to come always, always, always maintain, always kind of control the narrative. Never let the narrative get away from you. Always be in front of it. Always be kind of putting, you know, putting the narrative that you want out there just so you can guide the story to where you want to a conclusion that always makes your client or the artist that you represent look amazing. And this is a great, quite a clear and clever way to do it by saying that he cracked his ribs and still kept on performing which is absolutely ridiculous you crack your ribs like the way they say he did and you're not performing for a very very long time you might even be in the wheelchair that's how bad it could be in terms of the pain and whatnot so i'm glad to hear he didn't crack his ribs glad to hear he did continue on because like i said i'm a big fan of post malone anyway i do enjoy his music even though some people think it's a culture vulture i actually got a lot of time for the dude um he generally stays out of trouble keeps his mind his business is into life performing doesn't sing with the backing track for the most part and yeah i and it seems like a pretty decent dude so i've got a lot of time for the guy so big up him and glad he isn't um nursing some cracked ribs some other news that happened across the weekend was this crazy but hilarious video that went viral um of this guy in a new york mcdonald's with a hatchet um for some reason i don't know what it is about america again we don't have this issue in the uk we there's some videos out there but for the most part there's not the plethora right plethora of videos from the united states where it seems like every other week there is a skirmish a scuffle some sort of serious or fatal incident inside or outside of some sort of fast food establishment and obviously in new york there's been various cases of it happening outside of about of a flipping mcdonald's obviously we've got the story that i covered a while back about um the worker in mcdonald's who unfortunately was shot outside over some cold fries or some nonsense like that but this story is wild too because when you don't have any context behind it all you see is some dude with some really tiny shorts a really tiny vest and um, pull out a hatchet which is a small axe from his bag and essentially go after people inside the store and smash everything around him it's absolutely wild so i'll play the clip for you now if you haven't seen it if you're just hearing it please excuse me but it is a clip that i'll include in the show notes for you guys to check out if you want what the hilarious part is the guy that's got the hatchet who's going to unwrap he's going to unveil it soon is black and it's just hilarious to hear like new yorkers who you know love to drop the n-word um punching him in the face and um, trying to inflict pain on him whilst also calling him a nigger but not inflicting any pain on the dude it's quite a trip to watch I ain't gonna find he look like he about to be a shot. I said it. Oh, 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 Look how quiet everyone got. Slapped the guy in the back of the head, slapped him again. Lovely. Pulls up his very small shorts.
and ducks out. So that's basically what happened, right? So you just see that actually happen. <laughs> pretty fucking wild. And then I guess the um, update on it was as follows, courtesy of ABC7 News regarding the guy with the hatchet. It was exclusive. A man who went on a wild fast food rampage with a hatchet speaks out. The shocking attack happened inside a McDonald's on the Lower East Side. Thankfully, no one was seriously hurt. The man with the hatchet explained his actions to Eyewitness News reporter Kimberly Richardson. I kind of waited for him to finish doing whatever they were doing. And then I just did what I wanted to do. Pulled out a hatchet to teach them a lesson in this exclusive interview. The fact that he's on TV talking loudly and proudly about him pulling out a hatchet, which I'm assuming is there's some sort of legality issue in terms of owning that, right? Especially pulling it out in that way, in terms of damaging all that property, in terms of assaulting the people he did on camera, is absolutely wild. That's, this should speak for this guy's um, uh, mental state or just his lack of give a fuckness. <laughs> it's absolutely wild interview michael palacio tells me he has zero regrets for doing this friday morning most important thing is don't be afraid to defend yourself michael tells me things went south at this mcdonald's on delancey street after a security guard ignored his request to use the bathroom he maintains words were exchanged with the customer then things escalated now there's a there's a conflicting story out there that alleges that the hatchet man was indeed trying to pick up one of the girls in the video. I think it's the girl that's sitting down in the pink that he kind of goes across to, to sort of like weirdly intimidate. I think if I could scan across here, yeah, this lady here, that's the story. Allegedly, he was trying to pick up this lady here in the pink. She rejected his advances. I guess the lady was there with those other friends who ended up who were trying to punch him at the beginning of the video and then it obviously escalated to what you see um you know towards the end of the video in terms of them in terms of him kind of you know throwing the flipping or kind of going around with a hatchet that's some one of the stories but he's obviously alleging that he tried to get into a toilet and it wasn't allowed to, i don't know i don't know what's true but let's just continue michael he admits he had been drinking threw a punch that oh really dude really you admit you've been drinking <laughs> who would have guessed <laughs> There was plenty of pushing and shoving with three men who then turned on him. Video shows Michael on the receiving end of blows to the head. He tells me he has been... Yo, he ate those shits like Tyson Fury at flipping Deontay Wilder's punches, mate. They did not make a dent, you know what I mean? They did not leave a scratch, nothing. He just literally waited for them to finish and then bucked out the ting. After four and had had enough. He calmly pulled that hatchet out and police say started menacing people, smashed a glass wall and slapped one of his attack. Police say, we've all seen the video, mate. There's, there's nothing alleged or police say about this. We've seen the video. My intentions were not to hurt anyone. My intentions were not to... Oh, really, dude? You carry around a hatchet not to hurt anyone. What do you do with it then? Just pull it out and, and hope people run away. What if someone charges you then? Like, come on, man. Put anyone in a hospital or dice anybody up. The reason why I pulled out the hatchet was because, okay, I'm going to get back at these guys, but I'm going to make sure that they don't jump me again. It's not clear if police are mm. looking for the three Makes men, sense. but Michael tells me he's not interested in pressing charges. You don't need to be in jail to learn a lesson. I oh, really? You're not interested in pressing What's he talking about? You pulled out a weapon, of course. Why, why would you be? Honestly, this guy is tapped. I hope that the fear they felt that night is enough to never assault someone again. So why did Michael have a hatchet in his bag to begin with? He's a messenger and tells me he just feels safer carrying it. I'm always out there on the road, so I'm always actually getting into it with drivers, which is what the tomahawk is for. It's not for people. It's for trees what? and, you know, vehicles. Michael is charged. Oh, my God. Anyway, absolutely ridiculous story. And to make matters even worse, people have now found his Instagram account, which is um, on the block with Soho. And he allegedly has been doing the media rounds and, you know, collecting the bags as well, which is absolutely hilarious. So if I go back to a couple of these screenshots, um, what does it say here? Uh, the whole hood is showing me love, right? Him taking a screen, just chilling. Uh, don't want the country or not like that, okay? I'm not into, it's a screenshot taken from his, Insta, from his Instagram stories. I'm not into politics, just to be clear. If I get into politics, the government will kill me. <laughs> you heard that you heard that fbi cia i just like bikes fighting and black people and they like me too that's it no revolution no underground railroad niggas just chilling y'all be sure to have an amazing day like 
clearly this guy's tapped, right? Like, no word about it. T A double P E D. Um, but then he states as following: He said, and he said he had an interview with the New York, so just baiting up his spot here, like idiot, Id- idiotically, I think. The New York Post sent two big white house dudes to the Bronx interview, and we chopped it up. No pun intended. They paid me twenty k. Just you know, saying this out loud is a bit dumb. He's got another one where he says uh, someone was posted about him there, and he's posting a lot of screenshots of him being in Brazil. Um, and then the latest update here, courtesy of ABC News, was that he had been arrested. So I'm not too sure if those updates about him now were taken now, post him going there to get arrested or whatnot, but it does make a lot of sense why he would get arrested. It says here, courtesy of ABC 7 News, a man was arrested after a viral video clip um, captured him wielding a hatchet during a fight in a McDonald's, Manhattan. The incident happened on Friday, just before 2.30 a.m. inside of McDonald's. <laughs> Nothing good ever happens inside of McDonald's after, what, 9 p.m., right? It's always something pops off, always. That convergence of people from, like, going out to clubs, from coming back from night shifts, from just hanging around on the block, from being bored at home. It all kind of converges all at once and it's just weird energy, isn't it? <laughs> That's kind of, you know, trickling around there. I can only, I would love to see it. If someone would actually make it or if they would permit it, I would love to see a reality TV show based on people who work at a really busy metropolitan McDonald's, right? A one that's sort of like in the city centre that's right on the strip or something. Um, that would be cool to see, like all the, all the weird faces that come by that place, the workers that work there what and what they have to put up with. That would be proper blockbuster TV. It continues. It says, the incident happened. Uh, duh. Police say three unidentified men going to a fight with a suspect and 31-year-old uh, Michael Palacio. Um, obviously, Palacio said what he said there. He maintains the words of exchange with the customer. Then things escalate. Palacio admits he had been drinking and threw a punch. There were plenty of pushing and shoving. Duh, 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 duh. So, yeah, he's been arrested allegedly. So, let's see what I'll go on in this story. But one absolute insane thing. And, again, another example of just how nuts it gets out there in America if you go to a fast food joint. You know, something's just transpired that you just won't ever imagine. And you have to always kind of be on your twos. You have to always be, you know, keeping your eyes peeled. Yeah, this guy on the video just bought copped his stuff. I kept him it was hilarious it's absolutely crazy absolutely crazy and the thing about McDonald's too is that for the most part when this stuff happens it doesn't actually mean anything changes people still just continue doing what they do the workers keep you know making the burgers making the fries and whatnot and people keep the orders coming in nothing actually changes um which is quite cool to see you see that <laughs> oh is that, that's fake I think isn't it right I'm pretty sure that's fake but anyway um we've seen most of it We've seen most of it. Let's see what the developments are over the next couple of days regarding that whole issue. But it is pretty hilarious to see it from the outside. I'm not going to lie. I'm not going to lie. Um, Another issue that I saw that I thought was pretty funny and interesting for the most part was this. Let me show you this for the most part. Let's see if I can get it up on here. There's that one. Where is it? Oh, I didn't load it in time, did I? Yes, I did. There you go. So, um, I don't know if some of you know, but this young lady went viral on the internet lately because she decided to out um, Adam Levine and the fact that she'd had an affair with this guy, right? And I'm sure most of you are aware of who flipping Adam Levine is, right? In terms of him being the lead singer of fucking Maroon 5. And essentially, she decided to, you know, blow up his spot and tell the world that she'd been she has been involved in a affair with him for what a year or something right going on it and it's been quite big news of her you know on my side of the internet and the funny thing about it has been all the debate that sort of transpired around it right because for the most part my initial reaction to it was that um everybody involved in the story with the exception of the wife maybe you could include in some respect because there is an element of me that believes people especially in relationships like that are aware of what their partner is doing and usually have to decide are you going to confront it or you're going to just ignore it and hope it goes away and most people unfortunately because they're in love decide you know to go for the latter and hope it goes away and it doesn't and obviously the more public it gets the more hard it gets to pull away because loads of conflicting issues at hand blah 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 so everybody's kind of semi at fault but for the most part the two people who are definitely at fault is the mistress and obviously Adam Levine for stepping out in his marriage and obviously for the girl for baiting up the spot and not doing it even in like a way of like hey you know I'm alerting people of this big being guy being an abuser or whatever it may be it just seemed like an opportunity to basically get some clout um, boost, boost her following boost her notoriety and essentially get us off in headlines which has obviously worked for the most part <clears throat> but the other side of the story which is quite interesting is the fact that Adam Levine is married to this girl whose name is Bahati Prince Solo, 
was it Prince Low? Prince Low? How do you pronounce that? I think it's Behati Prince Low, right? Behati Prince Low, who also happens to be a Victoria's Secrets model, right? So people are just basically getting around to the idea that when it comes to cheating, especially when it comes to cheating in marriages, it's really less of an issue of the fact of the person being attractive or not attractive and more so to do with the issue of the person having options or not. And this is kind of the unfair and kind of real life situations that kind of transpire around this whole issue. So as you can see, there's a wife there, obviously, you know, modeling Victoria's Secrets, you know, you would kind of consider her to be one of the, you know, top 1% women in the world in terms of looks and body and all that sort of stuff stuff so people are kind of shocked like how the hell could she cheat on someone like that right with just a regular run-of-the-mill instagram model and i'm going to maybe expound on that a little bit more but let's kind of play the clip of the lady herself basically exposing the whole situation which went viral of course over the last couple of days so here she is on twitter or no it's on tiktok actually making this announcement but it was shared everywhere and her name is what summoner stroff i'm just gonna rip the band-aid off because i've retaken this like 10 times now Essentially, I was having an affair with a man who's married to a Victoria's Secret model. At the time, you know, I was young, I was naive, and I mean, quite frankly, I feel exploited. I wasn't in the scene. Boo. First red flag for me. Attributing you hooking up with a married dude for like more than a year and calling it exploitation is manipulation and flipping, ob you know changing the narrative to suit your cause to the nth degree you know you knew what you were doing you're just as much to blame as he is let's not try to make this out to be he was somehow uh, you know um he somehow had you in some kind of captivity he held you against your will he didn't like i am now um so i was definitely very easily manipulated we're in five is practically you know what the funny thing is about that easy manipulation thing on one hand people like this will be like hey i'm a girl boss I do my own thing. No man can tell me to do this. I'm, I'm, I run my own clock or whatever, whatever. But on the other side, you want to cry victim. And I've always said you can't have two. You can't have both, sorry. You can't be the flipping girl boss and also be the victim. You have to choose one or the other. Um, but obviously in this case, because you want to, you know, curry favor from the public and make it seem as if you are a victim, the best way to do it is to paint the narrative in that way. So it obviously makes you look like one. Elevator music at this point. So I'm sure you know who Adam Levine is. So now she's showing the screenshot of her texting with Adam Levine via Instagram DMs. The interesting thing about this too, that you see quite often when it comes to people who cheat, especially high profile people, a lot of it seems to happen on social media. You rarely see text chains of people DMing or messaging each other on like WhatsApp or iMessage or SMS. It's usually always through Instagram DMs. I wonder what, that's, well, I guess the reason why is because there's probably, the person you probably want to cheat on with is definitely going to be on Instagram, right? There's more options to choose from, but it's funny that it always seems to happen on Instagram DMs. So you can just imagine the amount of damage or carnage somebody could do if they have managed to find a way to hack instagram dms on the back end and go through loads of loads of notable celebrities dms and see well gone in there because there's a lot of fuck shit happening in those dms but this dm is, is, is from ab levine and the girl ab levine says in the screenshot it's truly unreal how fucking hot you are <laughs> like it blows my mind <laughs> pure horny conversations she replies back saying i mean i think the same seeing you in person i was like i'm fucked and he says, you are 50 times hotter in person to the girl. And so am I. Ha, ha, ha. And with the laughing, crying, laughing emojis, which obviously you usually when you do laughing, crying emojis, you're usually trying to not make it seem like you're being too up your own ass. It's kind of a weird defense mechanism to not make you sound too crazy. But the fact that Adam Levine thinks he's 50 times hotter in real life says a lot about him, right? He's like an adult fuckboy, isn't it? How old is Adam Levine age-wise? Is he like 50? Adam Levine age. He must be 50, right? Or is he... Oh, he's 43 years old. To be a fuckboy at 43 years old, he's like the apex fuckboy as well. He must be like the the kind of... um, What you call it? He must be the the archetype from all fuckboys in terms of their looks, right? He's got that beard going on, the arm tattoos. He's got these fucking corny tattoos all over his body. That look amazing, don't get me wrong, but they're tattoos made for Instagram, right? Just, you know, nice artistically placed tattoos that kind of will get all the girls melting and all that sort of shit. He did that whole stunt with having the fake rose tattoo on his face. You remember that? Um, uh, what, is it? what is it? Rose tat face tattoo. 
I'm sure I must have spoken about this before, but I remember him doing that little fake stunt with the face tattoo, which wasn't real. I was told, I think it said it was some sort of fake thing. Um, but I don't know sure if it is. Who knows if it is now? I don't really care. But, you know, just pure fuckboy stuff, right? Even those faces he's pulling here, tongue sticking out, walking down the street with his top off, you know, showing off the bod and all that to all the, to all the paps out there. Pure cringy fuckboy shit that, you know, if anything, any girl should have their red flag sort of like, you know, waving in the air if you see it. And it continues. Um, but Adam and I were seeing each other for about a year. After I stopped talking to him over, you know, a period of months, this is uh, how he came back into my life. Notice, came back into my life. Not I didn't, you know. So he definitely gave him some some action still. It's kind of gross to see a notification from daddy, the family, and then see Adam Levine trying to creep in the comments. <laughs> Horrendous. He said, okay, serious question. I'm having another baby, and if it's a boy, I really uh, want to name it Sumner. She's got a friend called Balin. That must have, that says a lot about the lady, isn't it? <laughs> Balin, what kind of name is that? You okay with that? Dead serious. Um, <laughs> I was like, this is more so, this is not even shock the face she's pulling here. This is more so like, she's basically sucking herself off in it. This is a weird kind of, um, this is more about her as it is about exposing a serial cheater. This is basically what it is. This is my moment in the sun. Oh my God, you want to name your kid after me with my dumb name? It's like, no, you don't. And then look, also, like, I don't know. It's a good thing. Like, I'm in hell. Like, I have to be in hell at this point. <laughs> I mean, my morals were unknowingly compromised i was completely look at that phrase my morals were unknowingly compromised that's a new one isn't it? it that's a new way to kind of avoid all accountability my morals were unknowingly compromised after one year fair enough if it was a one night hookup or if it was like a series of drunken events where you don't really remember what happened and you feel like something untold might happen cool but consistently meeting somebody for a year who you know has a wife and maybe some kids and shit is it is what it is isn't it you both were involved in the situation just admit your fault say you're sorry say it was an embarrassing part of your history it's something that you kind of had in your chest that you had to let go and you had to kind of let it out there and keep it moving but you know <laughs> those phrases are fucking nuts man absolutely nuts they manipulated i didn't heal this privately i never wanted to come forward because yeah right obviously i know the implications that come with doing what i do what implications you're an instagram model no one gives a fuck that you fucked adam levine if anything you'll probably increase your bookings right do you mean because you're more well known and those brands just want to get their product in front of people who are captive and engaged and people are going to be engaged in you for the next what couple of days and then the story will obviously kind of die it's already dying now at the moment but this idea that you're kind of get blackballed from the industry because you expose adam levine for being a cheat is ridiculous <laughs> no you won't getting money the way i do and being an instagram model um, so being tied to a story like this, it's like, I know the stereotypes. I had sent... What? That you're a fault? It is what it is, isn't it, really? There's no stereotypes. It just is what it is. Your actions are a pre your actions are basically a, a way to kind of describe you as a person and you did something reprehensible. It is what it is, isn't it? I'm not here to judge, but, you know, what, what else can you be? You're not a flipping astrophysicist, that's for sure. Um... I had sent some screenshots recklessly to a few friends I thought I trusted, and one of them had attempted to sell to a tabloid. Um, of course. So here I am. But anyway, in general, the whole point of this whole thing that I wanted to basically um, talk about was the fact that I think for some reason, I'm not too sure why it is, but there seems to be a real big misconception when it comes to... Um, when it comes to flipping men, high profile men uh, cheating on their partners for the most part, right? And I think a lot of it comes down to this weird idea that, you know, if the person is hot or is attractive anyway, why would you step out and go do other things? People, especially women, can't kind of get it through their heads that for the most part, when it comes to high profile dudes, um, less, less, less so to do good looking guys, but I think when it comes to high profile dudes in general, 
the fact that they have options, most guys who just explore them anyway. I think the guys who don't have the options maybe find it easier to be in a committed relationship. But those who have options and who have opportunities to kind of step out usually will take them, especially when they're presented in a way that just makes it easy. You know, you know, are you out in an event? You travel a lot. Um, maybe somebody slides into your DMs. You don't have to make the first move. Most guys, especially if they're flipping, you know, artists and you know already have a bit of an ego and see somebody basically you know hyping them up or making them feel special will definitely kind of you know try to dip their toes in that situation and get involved for the most part and that's the unfair situation about it it's less so to do with like what the person that you're married with did and it's more so to do with the option that you have available as a dude for the most part with women maybe it's a bit more complex maybe you know there's a element of emotional teaching all that sort of stuff that's not really physical and stuff that can happen um whatever it may be mental stuff i don't know but for men for the most part especially if you're a guy that's high profile let's forget good looking forget your looks or anything just in terms of somebody that's got a notoriety behind you you just have more options to do it so you take advantage of most regular dudes don't have the options so you don't even have the options to do it in the first place you just get kind of given what you're you you take what you're given and just you're happy enough that somebody's willing to kind of allow you to basically get in between those legs you know what i mean um but this just, you know, it just is the nature of the business. And I think the unfortunate part of it, if you are a partner of somebody like an Adam Levine, you kind of have to come to realization that most likely a partner is going to cheat and you have to decide, you know, what your stance will be if that news does happen. Are you going to be somebody that takes a stand and decides to split with them? Or are you somebody that's going to be okay with the situation, try and manage it and say, hey, I know you're an international superstar rock star whatever you are pop rock whatever fucking shit he does i know that things happen you might have groupies my stuff happen on the road and i just want you to just make sure that you respect the household you respect the family you respect me and our kids or whatever it may be and don't do anything publicly embarrassing so if you're gonna do stuff make sure no one finds out make sure the press doesn't find out and it's cool and don't bring it back home and that's probably it that's what you have to decide either you're going to stand either you're going to stand against it or you're going to make it work but this idea that it's never going to happen is really really naive because now we're seeing doesn't matter what the actual wife looks like and again she's extremely attractive by conventional standards you know still if you're a dude who has options you will also cheat on this woman which is really wild just think about it as a regular civilian guy but it does happen on a regular basis you know what i mean i think most men out there or most women should have had their eyes open when the whole beyonce and jay-z story happened because for the most part a lot of women out there would consider jay-z to be quite ugly right in terms of his physical attributes and whatnot I have, i've even heard some women say it doesn't matter how rich he is they would never get with him sort of thing so the fact that somebody that looks like him would cheat on beyonce would obviously i think should open people's eyes to say you know powerful men who are not known or whatever it may be have options and they're always going to explore them well most of them will explore them if they don't explore them that's when you definitely got a flipping diamond on your flipping hand and you should hold that guy close to your chest as much as possible and never let that person go because again it's very very rare but you know um that summer store woman is absolutely disgusting and reprehensible she didn't do this to bring any awareness or attention to adam being a creep or for being an abuser or whatever it may be just did it to kind of boost her own profile and in the process of kind of sharing your truth she has inadvertently destroyed a family destroyed her <laughs> a marriage um and essentially kind of painted herself to be the other woman forever and ever now well, you know what i mean unless she does something incredibly amazing in her own career the only thing people will basically ascribe to her was that she was the other woman in that whole adam levine and victoria seeker model sort of issue so it really is a bit of an own goal she did shoot herself in the foot for what a couple of hundred follow a couple of hundred thousand followers maybe a book deal maybe maybe a tv appearances maybe and i don't really think it's worth it so bit of a bit of a faux pas in that regard but you know i guess she was bored at home with nothing to do and wanted to kind of get a bit of traction and so far it's worked in it so i guess all is fair in love and war yeah so kanye was actually on this um pretty interesting podcast um a few days ago called allo mindful podcast where he essentially spoke about, you know, his current issues that he has going on with the Gap and stuff to do with Adidas, his general mindset and overall. It's a pretty kind of interesting interview all, all around. It's only 30 minutes long, but it's pretty kind of um, jam-packed with information for people who are fans of Kanye, you know, myself included. But one part that really sort of grinded my gears and really kind of got me hot and bothered was a section in the podcast just really at the beginning of it 
where essentially the um, host of the show is basically talking about a book that he's read and quoting some things and he basically tells Kanye that he's read a few books a lot of books whatever it may be and Kanye basically replies back with I've never read a book and sort of kind of boasts about the fact that he doesn't read overall and it just really grinded my gears for the reasons I will explain after I play the clip he you know I, I was telling him that I've read a book at least a hundred times and basically the um the meaning of the book is that if you believe you can, then you can. But if you believe you can't, then you can't. There's, there's two people. Um, the man who thinks they can and the man who thinks they can't. And they're both right. That's right. That's what you were saying, but that was like a simplified version. Yeah. The one who wins the race is the one who believes they can. The oak lies in the acorn. And Ye was telling me that he hasn't read this book, but I was telling him that every positive attribute he naturally embodies. And that's extraordinary, you know, to have that confidence, you know, from being such a young kid and going out there and inspiring and having this vision and actualizing it is, uh, is extraordinary. Also, when you said I hadn't read this book, I actually haven't read any book. Reading is like eating Brussels sprouts for me and talking is like getting the Giorgio Baldi corn ravioli. Oh, yeah. <laughs> like, a, like a good conversation mm -hmm. is Mike, Mike Howe that invented the rip saw. So, you know, him describing reading as being akin to eating broccoli, you know, which is what a kid would say about broccoli, right? Because you, you want to eat flipping chicken nuggets and chicken dinosaurs and happy face potatoes, whatever it may be. It's pretty hilarious, right? But it goes to maybe speak to where Kanye is as a person overall. But the reason why I find it infuriating overall is because, you know, you can sit there and say you don't read books, but if you're Kanye West, for the most part, if you surround yourself with the people that he does surround himself with, the likes of Elon Musk and all these, you know, stellar designers and artists and stuff, by proxy and by default of standing around these guys and being friends with them and talking with them over dinners and drinks and going on holiday with them and partying with them, you're essentially reading books because they read them. They're going to relay back information to you that they've read in books, you know, anecdotes, maybe things, you know, that maybe they think will maybe apply to your journey or to your struggle or whatever it may be because I know for me you know having read you know basically four books a month for the majority of my life right I know for the most part if you're an avid reader you know avid readers out there will probably understand you can't wait to tell somebody the things that you've read or the things that you found out especially if you think it's going to be somewhat helpful because you want to basically pass that knowledge on you rarely read books for your own enjoyment you read them kind of yeah obviously partly for your own enjoyment and also for the you know the enjoyment of basically sharing the ideas and the recommendations of books that you basically read that have kind of changed your life or impacted you in any kind of meaningful way so this idea that he hasn't read any books is dumb because he has because of the people he hangs around with and also the other part about it that's really interesting is that this is the guy that basically you know for the most part you know even if you're a big Kanye stan you would obviously say that one of the things that Kanye suffers from a lot is his poor communication style right he has a very strange and maybe um obtuse and maybe you know um what do you call it uh, confront, not kind of confrontational. He has a very difficult communication style to kind of pass through and to kind of navigate and to kind of deal with maybe in personal life and also in his business. We've seen it through the kind of, you know, public spats he's had for the most part where, you know, he's been maybe right in some of his points, but the way he's kind of got it across has made him come across like a bit of a piece of shit, right? Or a bit of a whatever, maybe bully, whatever word you want to describe to it. So for someone to sit there and say they prefer talking over reading, yet people complain about your communication style is absolutely hilarious to me. And the other part of it that's also hilarious is that for the last few weeks, we've seen Kanye ranting and raving online about, you know, deals that he's kind of upset with, whether it's Gap that he'd recently terminated, whether it's Adidas that he's in, you know, back and forth with, um, whatever it may be, he's kind of been in some way, in shape or form, in some sort of you know tussle with somebody concerning a contract he has i think before he was arguing with def jam for his masters like loads of things like that so for somebody who kind of wants to boast about reading maybe he should read because it seems like he can't read or understand contracts which also is just interesting because he's meant to be this big mogul guy this big um businessman and entrepreneur all this sort of stuff which he clearly is because he's become incredibly wealthy and successful over a very short period of time with the stuff he's been doing um obviously recently with yeezy and whatnot but clearly, 
there is something missing in terms of his maybe understanding or how business deals and deals with corporations are put together, relationship building, how to communicate effectively, make it work, whatever it may be. I don't know what those are because I've never been in those rooms, but there's definitely something missing in his basically arsenal of skills that would basically put him in a position where he's consistently having to come across these hurdles. And then they're not specific to him. They're not things that have been done only to him. They're things that have been done in a situation because effectively the business side of things hasn't really been addressed in the right way the relationship side of thing the relationship building side of thing hasn't been addressed in the right type of way and now he's in this position where he's basically ranting and screaming on instagram posting screenshots of contracts and stuff and asking people for help so on one side of things he's this creative genius who should be left alone to do whatever he wants to do or the other side of things when he gets in trouble or he needs some help he cries to the public and asks everybody to kind of help him and it's really infantile and sort of babyish of him to do that kind of thing it really is kind of annoying and it kind of does piss me off in general because i feel like it's such a horrible message to send out as the people that you don't need to read because yes he may let's say he is one of the rare people in the world who don't need to read books because he's just that smart that knowledgeable that creative that amazing cool but it's not something that you should boast about because for the most part most people need to read books in order to get forward in life and i think for myself why it's triggering for me also is because I didn't really grow up in a, you know, in a rich family. I didn't grow up in a good or kind of nice neighborhood. Um, I had my struggles growing up and whatnot. And, you know, as much as I like to hate to admit it, my parents were right when I was growing up, right? Education was really one of the easiest ways aside from school or anything else that could allow you the opportunity to kind of escape your current circumstances to maybe build a better future for myself and my family and my friends and whatnot. That kind of gave you the prospect of kind of, you know, seeing bigger and better things out there in the world. And the easiest way to do it was obviously education, obviously in places like the UK with it being free, why not take advantage of it, right? Especially up to a certain level, right? It's always going to be free. So why not take advantage of it? And reading became, a, for me especially, having grown up in a really kind of, you know, frantic and crazy neighborhood, it became like a bit of an escape route to kind of escape the daily toils and struggles I had going on outside of life. So I kind of escaped myself through music and through books. And to see this guy kind of poo-pooing the importance of books completely is just absolutely insane. Because um, I could say he definitely has been successful in spite of his reading, but just imagine how much more successful or how more amazing uh, and how more stellar Kanye could be if he did decide to pick up a book or two, read an autobiography, figure out that maybe his experience that he's going through isn't only um, specific or kind of, um, you know, uh, specially made to him. Maybe other people in life, in other walks of life have gone through the similar sort of things. Maybe getting anecdotes and stories and stuff from situations in the past that maybe relate to his, whatever it may be. Um, books are important in that way. So to kind of poo-poo it in general, it's just really, really dumb. And also last point about it is that this idea that he's kind of promoting and putting out there that he's obviously starting, or he's done already, this done the school, this academy that he's starting, right? Where he's kind of trying to provide an alternative curriculum to what's going on there in the education system in the United States which is a good and noble idea there's a lot of cool ideas there about embracing technology um about teaching kids like you know actual kind of like skills that they can use and you know in, in the wider world where it comes to social media where it comes to computing whatever it may be right there's some novel and good ideas there but overall and obviously with having a christian founding and whatnot cool 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 that's all fair enough but for somebody that boasts about not reading to to all to then go out there and tell parents to basically send their kids to his school that's you know that's just getting this kind of just getting on his feet it's absolutely hilarious it's probably the worst way possible to promote a kind of mini alternative school um that i could ever imagine so it's really really interesting to hear him say that you know in spite of everything that's kind of going on in the world but hey what can you do so yeah i, I don't really understand that i don't get why he kind of kind of keeps beating about this kind of not reading thing it's not a cool thing it doesn't make you look awesome because you don't read if anything it kind of explains a lot of the situations that kind of kind of is going through in terms of his career and everything else but again you know who am i to speak about the great man who am i to speak so that is it agatino zing show episode number 601 thanks so much for tuning in been a pleasure to have your company and your time as per usual if it's your first time checking out the show please make sure you smash that like hit subscribe and share or whatnot if you're listening via the podcast app then please make sure to leave me a five star review on whatever platform you're using whether it's apple whether it's spotify there's a system to rate please leave a rate rating or a review even if it's one star i don't really give a crap just leave some sort of rating so people can see that people are listening and watching it so then i could use that information to try and get me some sponsors and some advertisement you know 600 episodes in i think 
I think this is the right time to start pushing that sort of stuff. So if you can help me in that side of things, I'd be greatly appreciated. And apart from that, link tools, all my stuff will be obviously be in the show notes if you need that as well. But anyway, that's been a fun show. Great to have you here again. Hopefully you were somewhat entertained. Um, to end this show, if you listen to the audio podcast, you'll hear my tune of the day, which is going to come from Jesse Rodriguez. And if you're listening or sorry, if you're watching the show, unfortunately you won't hear any tune of the day or just fade to black. But thanks again for tuning in. Take care. Be safe. Peace.